All right, well, it's 12.01, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. Uh, no matter where you are, we hope that you are safe and healthy. You are tuning in today to the virtual seminar, now webinar, of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. I'm Dee Dee Kuo, the Associate Director for Research at CDDRL, and today we are delighted to have Nancy O'Kale as our speaker. Nancy O'Kale is a visiting scholar for the year at CDDRL, and she is a former Draper Hills Summer Fellow with uh, Stanford as well. She was the Executive Director of the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy in Washington, DC, a think tank devoted to Middle East policy research. And before that, she was the Director of the Egypt Program at Freedom House. If you have any questions during the course of her talk, she'll speak today for about 30 minutes before we do a Q&A. You can type them into the Q&A box to be read later during the Q&A session. So without further ado, Nancy, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Didi. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be discussing this topic with you. It's a pity that we're not seeing each other in person. Uh, and I would, would have loved to make this like a conversation uh, more than a, a presentation and then a Q&A. Uh, but the silver lining of having this crisis, as much as it's devastating, is that it became very um, enlightening, enlightening for me for my work on governance and accountability. Uh, since the beginning of the crisis, everyone around the world are trying to see the impact of this crisis on the other aspects of life other than just the, the health issue. And one of those topics is the, uh, the opportunity that it gives to authoritarian regime and how this increases authoritarianism in one way and another. And it is a legitimate concern. And there are many examples, and I'm gonna give examples today in my talk about this uh, and how they are, like some authoritarian rulers are using this to extend their um, term or uh, crack down on opposition. However, there's nothing new in this. Um, all authoritarian uh, 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 rulers and uh, the dictators would use any opportunity to consolidate their power. And um, they would do that uh, using a crisis or other situations. So there's nothing really special about this for comparing to the exceptional conditions that the coronavirus creates. And although, yes, it is true, it does give authoritarian regimes a lot of leeway but at the same time, there needs to be a little bit of nuance when we look at this issue, because this crisis is present is sort of represents opportunities and threat for state and non-state actors and also the and society. So everyone is actually finding their grounds as much as there are a lot of threats to non-state actors and civil society, but also there are opportunities. And at the same time for the state, yes, it's giving them a lot of leeway and they use this opportunity to crack down. However, um, it's still also limiting in some way. And I'm gonna be talking about this today. Um, I just wanna clarify something that I am going to be using the case of Egypt, just an example to illustrate like the power dynamics that happens between those three entities, the state, the non-state actors, and society, and how does it affect them? So the focus really is not about Egypt, but more about the question of accountability and how does it affect the rules. And I just wanna make a disclaimer. 
that would be given any conclusive remarks about Egypt, like any serious researcher would not be uh, confident enough to give any uh, findings after only eight weeks of crisis management in Egypt and elsewhere. So basically the questions that I'm trying to look at are authoritarian leaders using the same policy instruments and approach to governance under this crisis. And are these instruments still very useful for them either to combat the pandemic or to maintain their own stability? And if so, even are these instruments still at their disposal under such conditions? So these are the issues that I'm gonna be um, talking about. And I will look at, sorry, I lost the, So the, the coronavirus arrived in um, our world where the, 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 it's not a plain level field. Uh, there were three dominant uh, leadership approaches that are, uh, have been prevailing for a long time. There's our populism, ultra-nationalism, and hyper-securitization uh, as a solution for for anything. So I'm going to talk today about how does the coronavirus and its impact play out uh, under like and affect all those approaches and affect the citizens and the states and the non-state actors. Now any crisis offers a really good opportunity for accountability in the sense that it gives a magnifying glass for us uh, to actually see the exaggerated impact of the policies that the government have been uh, adopting for a long time. So, um, and when those policies are uh, connected to health, uh, the impact becomes more um, uh, impactful and more, tangible and immediate. It's like a bad policy means death at, at some point. People, when it concerns their health and it concerns their own um, and their, and their uh, livelihood, uh, people start paying attention. And this is something that we all strive for, democracy advocates, that we get citizens to be engaged and interested in the work that would help uh, accountability mechanism. So that satisfies a very important thing. What happens is that we see citizens actually start asking questions for the government. Is like I'm sure you all saw um, in your own countries, uh, people are asking like detailed questions, like how many beds do we have? What are the number of ventilators? What is the capacity of the health sector? Things that usually people don't engage in and would rather call of we don't engage in politics. But by doing that, by asking those questions, they are actually uh, practicing their citizenship with, without calling it as such. And that's a very important point and very important for accountability because once they do that, they put pressure on governments and to respond. It is like, and I'm sure a lot of you saw like the joke and, and this graph which imitates the, the graph of exponential growth of infection and death, but actually it shows how, it, how, how as time passes on, we increase our focus on the issue. And that puts a lot of pressure on the government and they feel obliged to perform or at least give the pretense uh, of that they have solid policies and they are, in, uh, like, are being <laughs> effective. And they actually start also giving numbers and uh, information, even though in a limited way and the way they're gonna see necessary. And I'm gonna discuss this when it comes to Egypt and give examples of that. So in a way, the COVID-19 crisis has created a situation where citizens are sort of engaged and feel empowered and have the right to know and ask questions. Well, does this mean that the COVID crisis is representing a paradigm shift and a change in power relations and power dynamic? Not necessarily, because as much as 
COVID-19 is creating those circumstances that are favorable for accountability and we've encouraged it for a long time. Also, particularly with the special characteristic of COVID-19 that it is not over a limited time and it's not for a particular sector of society. Uh, because we also saw, see um, some similar examples when there is, uh, for example, um, a train wreck, uh, which happened uh, in Egypt. And uh, we saw like very um, graphic images of people running and being burned. And people were so engaged at that time, asking questions about uh, the Ministry of Transportation and like the maintenance, maintenance that the, the country have available for and the spending on maintenance and all this. However, because this happened as just an incident, it takes a very short time span and people go on with their lives. And the solution from the government side usually is something as cosmetic as sacking the Minister of uh, mm. Transportation, for example. So um, this is a very good indication and very supportive for our work on accounting. However, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of new ones there and there are competing factors. Some people, for example, say that COVID-19 is a democratic virus or they um, sort of say it's like equal opportunity threat because it infects anyone regardless of age, regardless of um, geographical location, uh, the state in the society, um, gender, poor and rich, anyone. However, I disagree with this description because as much as it uh, could affect infect everyone, but it does not affect everyone equally. Uh, just as the co coronavirus itself hit people with underlying conditions harder than healthy people, it also, as a crisis, hit societies with underlying inequalities and conditions harder than other societies or uh, with more equality, with People have access to health and access to justice and um, are able to actually demand support. Uh, so in a way, this is something that is working against the, the people and, and it's actually um, sort of extending what is going on, has been going on before, but in an ex exaggerated way because the, the impact on the marginalized become very, um, uh, sort of exaggerated and, and magnified. The second thing that works against the people and for an opportunity for the state is that it actually um, gives them an opportunity for using this exceptional time to extend their emergency law and um, have more power and uh, start trying to use this time to consolidate their power um, and crack down on their opposition. Uh, and all that works very well when you have the most important element that populist and an authoritarian regime use is like the element of fear. So you have the combination of the element of fear and the element of that exceptional time. And everything can go under the label of that this is an emergency state. But as the Russian proverb uh, says, like there's nothing more permanent than temporary solutions. And we're gonna see how this play out in, uh, in Egypt and, uh, and how it's like actually affecting the way uh, people are making decisions and responding and how the government are using, is using actually this thing. So the question really I'm asking here, and I'm looking into like my ongoing research is like, does this pandemic with its very special and specific characteristics, does it represent a paradigm shift and a real change in power relations? Or is it just an exacerbated, exacerbating the, the existing inequalities and power relations and even making the more the vulnerable, more vulnerable, more marginalized? So looking at the, the, the research that I'm doing, taking Egypt an example, it looks like it's more of a mixture of both. 
and only time will tell uh, where it will settle because it's I mentioned like how the state is uh, affected and how the society is affected, but also uh, non-state actors are being affected. We're seeing things that we are not used to. We're seeing drug, the drug cartels, for example, uh, are the ones who are providing uh, support packages for people who are harmed by the crisis. Uh, we're seeing in Brazil, Brazil, the, the gangs are imposing the curfew on people and making statements as in, uh, if you don't abide by the curfew, you're gonna, we're going to make you learn how to do that. And we're seeing, for example, things like the State Department uh, applauding uh, the Taliban for following the good um, approach and protocol for combating the disease. Um, so there are changing um, dynamics and changing roles and changing weight and power. And that goes back to the question that I'm asking is like, will, would that be a factor that will make policymakers change the instruments that they usually are used to? in their ruling approach. Um, would they continue to be the more, uh, following the more uh, securitized um, uh, elements and instruments? An example in Egypt, like there are three main uh, instruments or approaches uh, that the government has, uh, has used in order to maintain control. And that is um, the media, in order to control the narrative, oppression and repressing uh, people and um, arrests and all the forms of the security se sector abilities that playing out. And finally, um, the laws to institutionalize uh, this repression. So what I'm trying to examine here, we can try this um, with the case of Egypt, but also in other cases is to see are these policy instruments still at the disposal of those leaders? And if so, how are they using it? Are they, are they able to actually use it in an effective way, either to protect themselves and gain more power, or at the same time, which is connected, combat the disease? So just to give you a little bit of uh, a background and, uh, of what's happening in Egypt, uh, as of today, April 30th, the number of cases is 5,537, number of deaths is 392. Here are, you see on the screen, the number of <laughs> the existing, like the pre-coronavirus capacity of uh, the health sector and uh, the budget that was allocated for 2019-2020. Now, since the beginning of the crisis in Egypt, it started actually, we can mark it by March 6th, and this is when uh, the first infection cluster appeared uh, in uh, the a night cruise in Upper Egypt in Luxor. And then after that, as the situation started to evolve, uh, there was a, was a period where people are having a just a sort of doubt that what the government is uh, announcing in terms of number, uh, are they really true or not? And there were like the polarization in society from people who are saying that this is just uh, a conspiracy against Egypt and the rest are saying that there's nothing at all happening. And which is a dynamic that we've seen in all countries. Um, what was surprising actually that the Egyptian government came with some really um, coherent set of policies uh, that we are not used to, um, which follows most of the policies that other countries uh, have followed. First of all, they uh, mentioned that uh, there will be 100 billion Egyptian pounds, that's uh, around uh, 64 um, uh, million Egyptian um, uh, dollars. Um, and uh, that there will be uh, some uh, tax uh, relaxation in terms of the payment and some debt relief, 
support for the informal sector and support for and some compensation for people who are going to lose their jobs after they have imposed the curfew. All this is really good and uh, it was uh, unusual uh, for, for us to see like this kind of approach that we have a set of policies and they're being announced. On the other hand though, the government continued to follow its own approach of repression, uh, both to protect in, uh, itself, but also taking an advantage of the situation to crack down further on its opposition. For example, we've seen um, ex-parliamentary member Ziad al-Alimi and others who have been in prison for a while uh, being listed under the terror list. The, these are things that they think is like, well, the rest of the world is not watching, they can get away with, with something like that. Of course, the first thing that they um, focused on is the media and the crackdown on freedom of expression uh, to the extent that there is a, a foreign uh, correspondent that has been um, having her license revoked and uh, left the country because she wrote an article referring to um, a study with numbers that are different and more and much higher than that of the government. And meanwhile, the continuation of forced disappearance uh, for other reasons, rounding up people from their houses um, and increasing arrests and stopping people in the street and searching their mobile phones, all this is continuing to happen. Um, what I found useful is to look at how Egypt is doing and managing this crisis compared to its approach to manage the terrorism crisis. Because mm. early on, they were already announcing that there's like the war on terror and then there's the war on coronavirus. And I made a comparison between the different elements that you would see here of how the how the threat is being framed under the war on terror compared to the war on COVID-19 and uh, and also define like enemy um, and the form of uh, policy making and leadership and the media discourse all these things, and I'm, and I'm gonna give you some examples of um, the similarities and differences, gives us a lot of cues that things do not necessarily go into one direction. And as much as things are being favorable and the, the government is continuing to rule in its usual way and using its usual instruments, the response from uh, non-state actors and society is actually different. And there are some change in the balances of power. So for example, let's look at some of the similarities and some of the differences. Framing the issue. It was framed as it is framed with the war in terror, that we are like um, in, uh, in the war and we all have to fight it together using the same uh, ultra-nationalist discourse in the description of the fight and, and the war and the stand against it. And if you see, for example, from the two pictures over here, one of them is from the war on terror and the other from the war on COVID-19, and it just shows how the army is, um, is there and present and um, sort of the, even like the, the videos that they show use the same music background that they use mm -hmm. for the war in terror for the war, uh, the war in COVID. There's a, there is a very distinct um, uh, element that is different here, which is the policymaker and leadership style. Usually, and, and since CC uh, came to power, he is the face of the leadership in Egypt. Any decision is made under his name. He is the one who is leading and, and the military is seen as the implementer. However, this time, we hardly saw CC. And most of the decision making 
was done by the um, the cabinet and uh, the prime minister is the one who announces those. In the previous slide here, I have uh, I have been tracking laws and decisions that have been issued since the beginning of the crisis. And one of the things I noticed is that. Most of them are made in the name of the prime minister. Only one was with the president when he, when he appointed his advisor for health, former uh, health minister, uh, in order to uh, work with him on, on the issue. But other than that, everything is being conducted uh, and announced by the cabinet minister of health and the prime minister. However, there is a tiny detail over here. Yes, the decisions are being made, but and the face of um, the leadership of the crisis management is the cabinet. However, CC and the military is portrayed are the ones who are fixing the problem, the implementers. So when the, the cabinet or the minister may just like, adopt bad policies or wrong approaches, they will be the ones to blame. Whereas the military would protect its, uh, um, its own stability. Even to the micro level, uh, one of the things that were shown, uh, I think that was like 10 um, uh, days ago, where it showed like President Sisi going into one of the construction sites and yelling at the manager uh, because the workers are not wearing the mask. And it is such a micromanagement uh, scene that was uh, put out in the media. I don't know intentionally or unintentionally, but this is a reflection of how it shows that, yes, we're showing that the cabinet and the prime minister is the one who's making the decision and managing the crisis, where at the same time, uh, we're seeing that CC and the military are the ones who are actually doing the hard work. They're the ones who are shown in videos going around and disinfecting the streets. So I don't know how that works, but anyway. Uh, coming to the media discourse, again, it's the same uh, discourse as with the uh, uh, war and terror. Uh, it's hyper-nationalist and the sense of that there is like, we are at war and we have to abide by the, the decisions and uh, the rules. Um, but there is something really um, problematic for the media discourse and the framing of the threat here is actually finding someone to blame. And I think this is not just an issue of Egypt, it's actually an issue of the entire world. I mean, like I put here the cartoon of the coronavirus face with the, with the two guns. And that, I've seen that everywhere. And it's an attempt to try to personify this enemy that they cannot like uh, blame as they would blame the terrorists or the Muslim Brotherhood or have someone to step out there that we are fighting. And of course we see like the, the overwhelming securitized discourse, securitization discourse, that that's the only language we use. It's like it's war, it's fight, it's not for example cure. Um, so that's also something that I've, I've seen in the media. Now, there's something that, and, and, and when we come to policy instruments, again, they're using the same instruments. The emergency law was extended, and uh, it was extended uh, because of the situation and gave some powers in order to close schools and hospitals, which actually they didn't need to because they could have done that without changing the laws. Um, the, again, the control of the media and and, uh, and, and using like the security uh, kind of discourse. However, they find themselves also in a problem, which is a legacy of the way they have been following in their leadership, which is there is always a lack of transparency and a lack of trust in the government performance and the government statements. And this has been like so clear under the war on terror. Um, and because there was like a, a complete media um, uh, blo uh, blocking, particularly in the area of Sinai. Now, 
when the government started actually to give numbers, even if we're not sure those numbers are correct for, for very different reasons that I can discuss later, but as much as they're trying to put out statements and be up to date and speak to people every day, the people are still not convinced. Some of them are considering that these numbers are um, just very modest and they're, the government is hiding something. And at the same time, others are thinking that it's just like, this is all just to scare us and stop us from going to work and protesting the whole situation altogether. And that's a product of the government performance and lack of transparency over time. So here we're looking at the, the tools that the government has been always used to uh, work out and um, utilize in order to control citizens are not necessarily working or at least not working in the same way. Of course, most of this can take a detour if the crisis continues and we see that there is a deterioration in the economy to the extent that it's leading to violence. And then we're gonna go exactly to the same point that we are, the arrest and the, and the fight and, um, and all the usual ways as if this crisis did not really shake the um, parameters on and uh, balance of power that is there. Coming, I'm gonna like go a little bit faster with the responsive citizen and non-state actors and maybe continue that with the, uh, when we come to talk about, uh, when we have the discussion, but we are seeing also a different um, view or change in the actions of the private sector and the relationship between the private sector and the military. Uh, so over the past um, six or seven years, uh, we've seen that mostly the private sector want, has been like operating under the auspices of the government, mainly the military, and sort of the military are subcontracting them to uh, do the work. However, we are seeing a bit of change of that, where we're seeing the private sector uh, are actually being sought after to try for help with the production of ventilators and um, giving them licenses and, and supportive uh, um, uh, elements in the bureaucracy in order to facilitate that. But at the same time, we also see, we see um, a change in the dynamics uh, between the different uh, businesses and private sector who are trying to make use of the crisis for their own PR. So this is all playing out within the non-state actors and between the non-state actors and society. Uh, another thing that we see that the country is facing right now because of the legacy of its approaches, uh, before 2013, uh, one of the biggest strengths strength of the Muslim Brotherhood is their ability to provide social services. Uh, and that's what differentiated them uh, from all other political parties. And they did have a strong and wide reach in society. After 2013 and the crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, something significant happened is that with the ban of the Muslim Brotherhood and their activities, uh, in their operation, they used to rely heavily on volunteers. When the crackdown happened, volunteers got really scared to continue to work with charities or organizations that provide humanitarian help, uh, humanitarian support. And uh, given that, uh, right now, it's very difficult to find volunteers who are willing and able to participate in that. So you see, again, the dynamics and the needs of the government is changing and the needs of society is also changing. Um, but there are other people who are, are operating in different ways. For example, like individuals or um, actors and belly dancers like participating in um, a movement or uh, a campaign to support uh, each to support 100 families. Mostly those are um, uh, trying to 
appease the government and show the government that they are supporting and like having the, their back. Um, and uh, Dr. Nagler is at AUC is doing like really interesting work about this issue and how there is a need for the uh, society at large to support the informal sector, for example, and the number of people that are losing their jobs and the government will eventually be overwhelmed by the needs and the, the decline in the economy because of the crisis and, and the curve. Um, so these are just examples of how uh, the, the roles are changing and that going back to the question of does this represent a paradigm shift and change in power relations or is it just exacerbating the existing inequalities and the existing um, forms of injustice that we have seen before or it's a mix of both which i have been seeing as i am monitoring the situation with egypt which, which is also the second part of the research is to compare it with other countries um, and i hope i can elaborate and uh on this uh in the questions and uh, also receiving your comments on that research excellent thank you so much for that excellent talk nancy um so the first question is from Hisham Salam at CDDRL, who says he wonders if you might have any thoughts on the ongoing debate in Egypt regarding the sort of reopening of the economy and how big business interests, regime allied media, et cetera, are affecting these debates. Okay. Um, this is a very interesting question and, and actually it gives me an opportunity to elaborate on a point of like citizen response to government uh, uh, approach and rules. Um, we've seen a lot of businessmen uh, having statements saying that people should uh, go to work with all the time about the way the current the, the curfew is stopping the factories and all that there is an underlying tone in the way the businesses are conveying these messages that as if that the workers are the ones who are going to be affected but we have to live with it and right. that they are immune uh, and this is again, a reflection when people say that, that COVID-19 is an equal opportunity threat, uh, but it actually is in the minds of people that not everyone is going to be affected in the same way, or even when they get infected, they have a better chance and better access to health and better access to um, uh, means to uh, protect themselves or even like go abroad for, uh, for medic better medical care. But the other interesting thing also is how we see how the people are responding to the government rules. And this is an interesting point in comparison between the war in terror and the war uh, on coronavirus. So under the war in terror, people mostly just follow what the government says. And they would turn a blind eye on any forms of repression or even try to justify it and say, we have to uh, swallow this and, and, and keep on because we are at war and we want the economy to go on. Uh, and they would justify everything that's happening is that we have to follow what CC is doing because he is protecting us. Now, with the curfew that was imposed um, on the 25th of March, uh, people did not really act the same. They are actually different find the curfew, uh, even talk shows are showing people going to the streets and going to the markets, and people are just protesting, uh, as we, we see in the US and other places, but people are protesting, but just not following the curfew. At the beginning, the government was showing some seriousness in the enforcement of the um, of this uh, of the curfew and given fines and closure of restaurants and cafes uh, that were open be beyond the, de the the time, but we see that the the whole theory that not just in Egypt and in the world that people would give up any freedom or give up anything and follow the rules of the government in order to protect themselves is not necessarily true and needs to be revisited here uh, because in that case 
they are actually giving up their uh, own uh, stability or own health and going on and defying the government's rule. Okay, uh, the next question is from Frank Fukuyama, who's asking, Sisi's lack of visibility uh, in dealing with the COVID crisis is similar to Putin's, for example. Do you have a theory as to why some leaders are choosing to remain less visible at this time, you know, even though they might typically be much more visible? All right, um, again, it's too early to tell and it's too early to make uh, assumptions, but my theory is that like trying to look at uh, the way CC is just uh, presenting himself in this crisis compared again to the war in terror. Uh, first of all, there's a reason why he was the face of the war in terror because this was his ticket to mm -hmm. presidency. He, that's the reason like people are saying like we support him because he is the one who protected us and got rid of the Islamists uh, and is putting the country back on track. Uh, and it is his project, it is his um, sort of point of leverage there. And he does not just appear, people might say, well, okay, but this is an issue of defense and it's only normal that the military and CC with his background to be like the face of it. Uh, but that's not true because it was not just limited to the issue of uh, the defense sector because we seem like very involved and visible with the construction uh, sector, uh, other, uh, other issues in, uh, and everything you could think of. Um, and the other theory why he is not that visible right now, I think one of the, 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 the very, um, exceptional um, characteristic of the COVID-19 that first of all we don't know what what's its end how it's gonna go and there's no prediction of how we can actually follow the usual way of pretending that um, that we are in control we are doing our best and we're following the procedures usually in Egypt, the most important thing is to show that the government is following policies and providing, and they boast about that. So one of the things that really made me laugh, I would have had on the slides here, of the, um, the national budget and uh, uh, committee in the parliament was asked, like, how do you evaluate the performance of the economy and uh, the expenditures of uh, last year? And his answer was, well, there was positive things, and there were negative things, we talked about some things, and a paragraph of six lines with only two figures, we're talking about the budget, only two figures. One that says is like, we had 25 meetings and we had 138 recommendations. And these were the only, things. we did our job. We are employees, that's, that's how people see themselves, even in the highest position, even being a representative of the people, that they are doing their job. And that's the perception of the president also towards the cabinet, towards the government. And they are ones who are just serving and following his rules. And it gives them a very good buffer when he is not the face of this, because if they, everything like goes into failure, he would not be the one to blame. In fact, he would be the one punishing those who messed up. And like, so it's, I think it's a, a self-protection mechanism, but again, uh, it's too early to tell to see how much he will be involved and how this will evolve. Okay, I'm going to start combining some questions that are similar. Um, so regarding the shift in power relations and a new paradigm between state and citizens, um, how do you see that playing out in other countries? I know that this is an early stage of your research, but that's one of the questions. And also Tom Finger from FSI is wondering if regime efforts to maintain the crisis and manage it uh, by providing information to the public potentially feed their expectations in demanding more information from government for related issues and policies. Do you see that being the case? 
I'm not sure about other countries. I have to also give it a bit of a, a, a thought and thinking about what's happening here in the United States. And um, there are different ways to look at it. As, uh, it's an opportunity for leaders to even like uh, put themselves as like in the opposite of CC, for example, Trump is uh, on TV 24 seven almost and we're seeing like giving his uh, long uh, talk of rambling, saying the same things every day. Um, and of course, this has to do with his upcoming elections, uh, but he's not the only one, political parties do that. Uh, but there is something here. And again, I wanna go back to the specific characteristic of COVID-19 as opposed to other crises, is that the, the longevity and the extent of the crisis, not something that happened over a week, it's not a, an earthquake, uh, something that's going on and we don't know its end. And by that, it's actually giving more um, reason and uh, drive for people to continue demanding uh, some uh, the the figures and numbers compared for example with the war and terror mostly i never heard like i've been working on on terrorism tracking terrorism for the past six years and i haven't seen people asking for example what are the numbers uh, of terror attacks in egypt i mean very few and only the specialist one like we we conducted that at the Tahrir institute for middle east policy so it's one of the things that we offered to fill a game, get gap but then actually the government started putting out those figures of the number of casualties and the number of bombing but if you talk to anyone in the street there's always their opinion is impressionist it's like oh we have terrorism uh we have a threat but not to the extent that people like what they're doing now following every day and seeing the number and the rate of and the exponential change in the rate of the death and uh, and asking about the number of testing. So the nature of the crisis with all its specific characteristics is putting leaders into um, a different situation. As mm -hmm. I said, uh, it does not mean that this is a shift in, right. uh, in paradigm. Uh, or an extension of existing inequalities. Okay, um, so Eric Jensen has a question. How has COVID affected regional cooperation and conflict? Obviously, with oil prices in decline, it's affecting some of Egypt's neighbors in a, a sort of significant way. Um, and also the crisis is manifesting in countries nearby. How do you think that that's going to affect the geopolitical situation? Well, I, I, I haven't had some time to monitor that, but you can um, at least uh, assume that with the change of oil prices that certain countries will be uh, allocating their budgets in a, in a different way, taking different policies. But so far, um, Egypt is still dealing with the Gulf as their patron in following almost similar their policies in addressing the crisis. So like when we saw that UAE is relaxing their, um, their curfew and protocol, Egypt also started relaxing uh, its, its protocol, the same with Saudi Arabia. However, we cannot really tell that this is associated because people, uh, because Egypt, for example, uh, had, uh, other reasons that led to the change in the policies. Okay, um, there are two somewhat related questions. One is first, um, what do you make of the infection and death rates so far? They're, they're somewhat lower than people would have predicted given the crowded living situation in Egypt as well as generally a weak health system, um, but it seems like the numbers are actually decent. So do you think that that's a product of sort of misinformation from the government or has the government actually done a good job managing the crisis? And a related question has to do with the media. How is Sisi treating the media right now? Um, is he censoring certain regions from being able to access information? All right, concerning the numbers, um, like anywhere, first again, like it's it's very early to tell if this is like a failed uh, crisis management uh, operation or not. But um, concerning the numbers, everywhere in the world, what is being publicized, what is being tracked, is not 
as accurate as the reality because the the testing, the, the, the rate of testing, the, the access to the hospitals, and, and all the other factors. Whether the government is deliberately putting out uh, fake figures, I'm not sure about that and I cannot tell. But what I can, I can say is that there are several factors that would contribute that not all the uh, people who are infected or the deaths are being reported. And I want to like refer here to the excellent work that Dr. Khaled Fahmi uh, provided looking historically at how people acted at the time of the plague, for example, that there is a historic stigma that is related to uh, getting infected or having, having the virus. Uh, and people would hide that they would that they have the, the virus they would even hide that their relatives or people um, in their neighborhood have died of mm. that uh, because of the fear of what would this entail the fear of going into quarantine and it's just like the image the scary image of uh, what that is so all these are factors that would be contributing to tell at least that the numbers that we're seeing is um, a bit more modest, if we can put it that way, than the actual numbers. Adding to that also another factor is uh, the testing capabilities uh, and um, the, the, the proportion of the number of uh, tests to the population. Another factor is that there's also a different difference in control between Cairo and um, the the main cities and the cities that are, are marginalized. We're actually we're, we're seeing like very strict or more strict rules in hospitals and the way that they're uh, following the quarantine protocol, where stories keep on emerging from remote governance governments saying that the number of medical staff that are being uh, infected and not actually going off work and that the lack of the um, the protection equipment and all the other things that are not as visible as they are in in that the a second question about the media and uh, uh, again like it's the same way as the war and terror like the complete just control over what can be said and what cannot be said it's almost funny when they watch when you watch the, the different talk shows that each day they say exactly the same talking points yeah. uh, in a different way, but they do have a list of talking points that they convey. One particular discourse in that talk is the focus on the issue that we have done our part, the citizens are not following. The citizens are the one who's gonna lead to the crisis. This has been, the pretext for the discourse since day one and it was repeated by the minister of health several times that again like we've done our part if things go wrong it's you who is who are responsible for leading to the uh, deteriorating of this of the situation okay so another question from larry diamond what's the most likely scenario for resistance to cc's rule and pressures for democratic reform do you think there's anything that might trigger political change in Egypt as a result of some of the trends you're discussing? Uh, I, I can't predict that and I wouldn't expect like a big change. Uh, as I said, it's like that there, there are some elements of change in power, but also there are other elements that are working in the benefit of the leaders, the use of emergency and fear and, and all this, and they will continue to do that. However, I think one element that could work in, the, in favor of the people is that with normal or ordinary crises, uh, the government could continue to be populist and mention the achievements and mention the how they are, for example, as in the case of uh, the war and terror, that they are winning the war and terror. However, in this case, no matter how you try to portray yourself that you are in control and you're doing this, you cannot hide that people 
Uh, you right. can for an extent, but you can't. The failure of policies or empty promises uh, is not going to uh, fly for long. Uh, and that may maintain the pressure on the government. However, I just like want to, with a caveat that if things deteriorate to the point that the economy is in complete uh, uh, deterioration and people are losing their job and there is like the fear of chaos, that would actually mean a stricter and uh, harsher uh, way of ruling of the military. Hmm. Okay. Um, so we don't have much time left, but let me ask a question from Aicha Alamdaroglu, who wonders what you, if you think the crisis will either empower or further impede the Muslim Brotherhood? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, and I would say rather than what it will do is like how they are mm, dealing with the crisis right now. And it's very interesting because in the past, if the situation was that pre-2013, the Muslim Brotherhood would have gained a lot of power because they are the ones who are able to deliver and to deliver to a wide and, and far reach. But right now, having them all out of the country or in prison, uh, I found it interesting that I was like doing some um, uh, so discourse analysis of the statements that they are putting out, which was sort of like a pity to see it that is so resembling of the statements that we would put out calling on the government to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, they, for example, but they still, uh, and they are giving like also empty advices to the government uh, in a statement that they issued on April 23rd, that they should start thinking about having a uh, local uh, production rather than having an expert in order to maintain the stability of the country. But I mean, like, they, of course, they didn't get away from the, uh, the sort of self-centered way of thinking of things as like one of their um, demands was to for the Egyptian government to release the Muslim Brotherhood medical doctors because they are the ones who are going to help resolve the, the problem. Of course, other things is just like how the media is also inflating the numbers and like the, the Muslim Brotherhood media and, and taking advantage of it. Okay, the final question just combines a few questions that we've gotten, which is, do you think Sisi will try to postpone this year's elections? And what do you think would be the public reaction to that? I don't think it would make much of a difference, honestly. Right. Um, I think he could could or not, could not do that. I mean, like it's very convenient not to have uh, uh, the elections, but right. I really don't think that's a that's a uh, an effective factor in the whole equation of CC and election, and because like it does not really work that way in the country. Interesting. Well, thank you so much, Nancy, for being with us today and for this incredible talk. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in, and we hope to see you next week and hope everybody stays safe. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you.